That's all there is to it? Yeah, I already set it up. You set it up? Yeah. Is that a wool sweater or it's an imitation? This is a sweater and this is a two piece. It's a what? Two piece. It's the same, but it's it's like a skirt and a sweater. <laughs> but is it wool or is it uh, synthetic? What is that? Yeah, wool. Ah, uh, no, no, it's not. Huh? Synthetic means it's. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I don't know. It's really really warm. Okay, it's hot right now. Hananina. Uh -huh. Hananina. Leia, fair demand. <laughs> Rojo Hala, Tahir. Taya Atkins. Okay. This is Malka. Good morning, Malka. Thank you for coming early. That's great. Where's your name? Here, Malka. They had a beautiful, beautiful program last night for the Kinnis. 36 Sifre Tyra they finished. 36 Sifre Tyra. They were dancing with them. Oh, wow, it was great. The most moving, there was many, many things were very, very moving, very inspiring. But the most inspiring of all was a story about a young man who uh, I think he was an orphan and his family were in dire poverty, dire poverty in Russia. And so they suggested to the family that they allow the child to be taken to the Chabad orphanage in Moscow where he would have food and clothing and education, and they consented. So he went to the Chabad orphanage where he grew up and he learned, and then he entered the yeshiva, and then he came here on Shlichas. I knew him, he was here on Shlichas. He was here for a couple of years. And then he became a Shlich now in Ukraine, and the war began, and he got a phone call from a woman saying that her grandparents, he was in the south, and her grandparents were in the north, and they were totally cut off with no water or electricity or food. And he didn't know what to do because it was so dangerous, bomb, places being bombed like crazy. And to travel several hours across the whole Ukraine to get there was very, very dangerous. He didn't know what to do. We figured, I'm here. I'm the Shlich of the Rebbe. The phone call came. I have an achreas, I can't ignore it. And so he loaded up his car with supplies and he went. And it was very dangerous, but uh, he got there, Baruch Hashem. They were so grateful. They were so relieved that he was able to bring them the supplies that they needed. It was very moving. It was Mama's very moving. One of the themes of the convention was to be a shriach with of the Rebbe, it's not just doing Torah and mitzvahs and not just teaching people, but it's being ready to accept the challenge of Monsieur Snefresh. To go, to go beyond what you... Okay, now we're in chapter two. We've just about finished chapter two. We were just to re re rehash some of the ideas about where the Neshav... Chapter two is about the second soul. Second soul is the godly soul. And Sir Kendra Bhatti just told me that I should tell you that she's coming. She's coming. So. Well, I can't tell any stories if she's not here. <laughs> okay. Okay, she's coming. She just came back. Home. Chaya, you're here? Yeah. Yes, okay. 
Hmm? You're, you're not mad at me? No. No? Okay, good. <laughs> So we learned very important ideas about the second soul, which is the godly soul, which is part of God. It's not that we're given a soul that is sensitive to godliness. It's God himself. And the godly soul can direct and influence the animal soul. That the point, the whole point is to make the animal soul not to be an animal. to make the animal soul into a godly soul. But the, the godly soul cannot learn Torah or do mitzvahs without the body and the animal soul. But the body and the animal soul are not naturally inclined to that. They are resistant, resistant. They don't want. So therefore, just like in the Western movies, a cowboy, they give him a wild horse, the wild horse does not want to have a rider. It's called a bucking bronco. And when the cowboy gets on, the horse tries to get him off. And it's a fight. And they have Rodeo to see how long can the cowboy stay on the horse. Obviously, that's how you tame a horse. That's how you make a horse into a horse that you can ride. So we have to tame the animal soul and make it into a godly soul. Or at least a good imitation. And this was compared to blowing. When you blow, you blow from deep inside. So Hashem gives us this godly soul from deep inside of himself. You know, you say, Hashem, I can't do this all on my own. He says, you don't have to do it on your own. I'm going to be there with you. And he is there with us because he's in the godly soul. Here she is. Good morning, Rachel. Rachel. So that's all the help that you don't need more than help, more help than that. Well, you could use more help than that. What's the help more than that? You have the help of your friends. They're in it together with you. And they're there for you. That's why they're friends. Okay. Shoshana didn't make it yet. Batya is here. Where's your name, Batya? Oh, down at the bottom. Okay, with a Y. Why not? And Rojo O'Connor. Second marshal that the altar, and that's a very, very important marshal to bear in mind, blowing. The Abish to blows the godly soul into us. How do you know? Because the Torah says so. It says, Hashem blew a godly soul into Adam. Well, what have, what's that got to do with me? That has last week's parsha. I'm Jewish. Isn't that the same for everybody in the world? No, it's not the same for everybody in the world because there's a special connection between Adam and the Jewish people that was established through Abraham when he buried Sarah in the same cave together with Adam and Chava. That made a connection between Adam and Chava and the Jewish people. That's a very interesting point. I never knew that spelled out so, so clearly before, as I saw in a sikha just this last week, Parshas Chaya Sara, the burying Sara together in Maris Machpelah with Adam and Chava established the connection with Adam and Chava with the Nefesh Elokis of the Jewish people, the godly soul of the Jewish people. Did everybody hear that? Did you hear it clear? Could you tell somebody else what I just told you? Okay, so I'm going to tell you again. What's your connection with Adam and Chava? They're the parents of all mankind. So why do we say that we have a godly soul and they don't? They have an animal soul. We have an animal soul. Our animal soul is from Clippus Noga. Their godly soul, their animal soul is from Sholish Clippus or Timaeus, the three impure Clippus. But they also come from Adam and Chava. Why are they different? Why are we different? And you have to know that we're different. Maybe some point in your life, you're going to have some temptation 
And you say, well, I'm not different from anybody else. Why should I be different from anybody else? Because you have to know that you are different from anybody else. By the way, I want to repeat to you that the weekly letter that I send out goes by email. If you want to get it, you have to give me your email address. Take a piece of paper and write it down, pass it around. Well, I sorry, I couldn't hear you. We had passed around a paper with the emails and it got left on my desk because five would come late. And I never, I never got it. So, so I never got back to you. So let's okay. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna start. Okay. Annoying. It's really annoying. Rabbi, what's the I answer? just have to take care of the settings, so the phone won't ring again. What's the answer? So right. Settings. No, not that one. There we go. Settings. Mute. Sounds. Mute. Oh, well, vibration. Okay. So what's the answer? Why do we say that our, um... What's the answer? Yeah. The answer is that a connection was made between the Jewish people who come from Adam, come from Avram and Sarah, with Adam and Chava, that they're buried together in Mar Samach Pela. Then when Avram buried Sarah in Mar Samach Pela, that established a connection between him and his children and Adam and Chava. I didn't see it written that way, but it means, I mean, what I saw written is what I told you, but it means that he was able to draw down from the life of Adam and Chava into the, the, the neshama and connected with the neshama of the Jewish people that he gave to his children, they gave to their children. Now you might ask a question, well, what about the converts? People who convert to Judaism, they're not exactly the children of Avram and Sarah. So that's why conversion is so such a uh, mystery and such a difficult process and why we're very careful about it. The Rambam says, we don't really believe in conversion for several generations. I mean, we accept it and we behave as if we believe it, but we have to see what happens. Because it could be that if it wasn't really 100% sincere and real, then they don't, their generations don't last. They run away like I knew a family like that where this young man wanted to learn with me and his wife was converted. Uh, there's a story, Batya. She was converted con conservative. And she had to have gear lechumra. She had to, she had to meet a, a, do a complete conversion. People, people say, does that mean I'm not, you don't think I'm Jewish? No, it doesn't mean I don't think I'm Jewish. But it, I, when I'm asked that question, I say, no. It means that you're on your way. You've completed certain stage towards becoming Jewish. Now you have to go and complete it. You have to finish it. If you're really sincere, you'll finish it. If you're not really sincere, you're going to drop out. And that's exactly what happened. They became, they started to get more involved in Judaism through Chabad. Then they moved to a part of town where there was a, a modern Orthodox shul, which was not Chabad and not 100% friendly to, some were friendly. Some, the rabbi in the shul was not exactly friendly to Chabad. He came from a different yeshiva. And so they discredited certain customs that she had taken upon herself, that they had taken upon themselves from Chabad, like all the members of the Chabad community, like is wearing a shekel. And they said, we don't, you don't have to do that. So she didn't do it. And, and Jewish milk, so you don't have to do that. We can rely on the government. So they, she dropped Jewish milk. And the next thing happened was she dropped her husband and ran away with a non-Jew. So that means that the conservative conversion wasn't really a conversion. That, that's the proof. That's the proof. So, that's, so then the question is, so how do, does a convert connect with Adam and Chava through Avram and Sarah? How do they connect with Avram and Sarah? 
How they if they're not really physically born from so this is a mysterious thing. How does a person draw down into themselves a Jewish soul? And the answer is they really have to want to. They have to want it with their whole heart. All the, with your, all your heart and all your soul and all your might. They have to want it so desperately that it can't be. And even if they're rejected by the based in for a certain reason, they don't, it doesn't stop them. They keep on wanting and they keep on trying. Until eventually, so where does that? So that's one way that a person converts. Then there's another question. Well, where are they, how are they connected? How they, uh, is there a deeper level? Well, there is a deeper level, which it's very mysterious. It's, it's it, maybe it's, it's it's Kabbalah or it's mysticism. But when Hashem gave the Torah to the to the world to the Jewish people, nobody wanted it. He wanted it should be fair. People shouldn't complain afterwards and say, why are we being punished? Why are we not getting all the good things that Jewish people get? And the Shem said, I don't want to hear any complaints from anybody, so I'm offering it to everybody first. All the nations of the world were offered the Torah before the Jewish people were offered the Torah. Thank you. How is that possible? How the Shem offered the, the, the Torah to the nations of the world? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe every nation has a guardian angel, so to speak. Maybe you call it a guardian ethos, a spiritual source of where the nation comes from. So maybe on that level, the Torah was offered to them, and each guardian angel said on behalf of the nation, no, it's not for us. You know, like for the, the children of Esau, Asa was a warrior. And when Hashem offered the Torah, so the, 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 the people of Edoim who came from Asa, eventually they became Rome. Rome destroyed the base of Migdash. Hashem said, do you want my Torah? They said, what's in it? He said, you shouldn't kill. You're not allowed to kill anybody. He said, what do you mean? We're warriors. We're soldiers. We can't live with the Torah like that. Our whole blessing is to be powerful and mighty in war. They said no. And each nation had its reasons why they didn't want the Torah. So he came to the Jews who were slaves in Egypt. I said, do you want, to, do you want a commandment? They said, we'll take 10. They make a joke. They said, do you want a tablet? We'll say, we'll take two. But they just said, yes, no questions asked. And that's the medrash that we learn at Shavuos time, that when Hashem offered the Torah to the Jews, they said, Nasev and Nishma, we want it. Yes, we want it and we'll do it. No questions asked, but we'll, we have to learn about it. We will learn it. We promise we'll learn. But they didn't ask what's in it. Hashem said, who revealed this secret to my children? This is a secret. The proper response when you're offered to do a mitzvah is yes. What do I have to do? When Rabbi Havakov would call in a young couple and say, do you want to go on shlichus? They would say yes. They didn't say, is it hard? Is it easy? When my son was a bacher, so he applied uh, for Bachar Shlichus to be sent to a yeshiva. And all his friends were being sent to interesting places, Australia, France, Italy, England, Russia, Ukraine, all kinds of places, South America. He was sent to New Haven. I said, how do you feel about that? All your friends are going to interesting places. You're going to New Haven. It's just like, you know, he says, wherever the Rebbe sends me, that's where I want to be. That's the right. That's, that's I learned from him. We can learn from our children. He says, wherever the Rebbe wants sends me, that's where I want to be. And we can adapt that and say, well, wherever my feet take me, that's where I want to be. And even if it's a strange place, we have to, why do we have to be there? We have to be there to say a bracha. We have to be there to, 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 to do a mitzvah. We have to be there to help somebody to come closer to Torah.
not to find out what it's like and to sin like all the other people there. We go there with a mission on a mission. Okay, so that's the first marshal of the second soul, that it's something Hashem blows into us. The second marshal that we have, the marshal is a P-A-R-A. -A. Why do you finish that word? Para. So para. Not a paradox, a parable. A parable is an example, a, a metaphor, something that explains, a story that explains an idea. So the second marshal is, a, is the parable of how a child is born from a father, from the highest level of intellect, pre-intellect, primordial intellect. You know what primordial means? Doesn't Primordial means pre, 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 before everything. In other words, before you have intellect in your brains, there's a concept of intellect high, that's higher than the soul. And that's where the seminal drop comes from for the child through nine months in the mother, with, together with the ovula in the mother's womb, develops a whole child. And even after the child is born, the child continues to get life from the life in that drop from the highest level of intellect of the father. Pre-intellect, higher than intellect, like pre you were pre-approved. You were pre-approved to be Jewish. 100%. And even afterwards, when the child is born, the connection, just like the child in the mother's womb is connected to the father who conceived the child. Even after you're born, you're still connected down to your fingernails and toenails, still getting life through the brain of the father. And of course, the father's life is still getting even after the father dies. And so that goes back to the grandfather, too. And the great grandfather and the great great grandfather, all the way back to Avram Avinu and Yitzhak and Yaakov, there was a young man. He spoke last night. He was a guest of honor at the dinner. George Rohr, tremendous, unbelievable philanthropist. He came with a good friend of his, a doctor who deals with stroke, Dr. Rudolph. And they told the Rebbe, but we started a minion in the Upper West Side, maybe the Upper East Side of Manhattan, for people who have no Jewish background. Rebbe didn't like that expression. He says, you have to tell these people that they have a Jewish background. Every single one of them is a, a grandchild of Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov and Sarah and Rivka and Rachel and Leah. That's all of us. That's Rebbe's message to every one of us. What more distinguished background could you want? So that's the second marshal, the second parable, that even after the soul is born and becomes a human being, is still connected to the life and the brain of the father, which is connected to the life and the highest level of intellect in Hashem. Where does that life come from? It comes from Hashem. Like we said, the tippy top of the lightning rod. The very, very highest level. And that's what's in you. That's what connects you. That's why you're here. That's why when you were offered the chance in your Chabad house, or your Shliach or Shlucha suggested you might come here to learn, and you said yes, and your girlfriend didn't. Because that's more realized in you than in your friend. And while the 6,000 kids can be on a college campus, this guy in, spoke from Nottingham, England yesterday. Robin Hood from Sherwood Forest in Nottingham. There's a college there with thousands of Jewish kids. I was so surprised. I've been there. It's a small town. I didn't know it was a big college town, a big, big college town. And there he is working with all these Jewish kids. How come some of them come to the Chabad house and others do not? How come those who come to the Chabad house continue and go to uh, Mayonot in Yerushalayim and others do not? And how come keep on 
because you know that that's more revealed in them the source in the brain of the father or the brain of all our fathers the brain of a in the intellect of Hashem, that's where the God, the second soul comes from. That's the second soul. That's what we have learned so far. And then we had the question, well, how come Jewish people are also different? If we all get a soul from the same place in the whiteness of the brain of the almighty God, so to speak, not that he has a brain. That's just a, a, and also a parable from human it says, from my flesh, I'll understand godliness and concepts and spirituality. So how come we're all so different? And the answer is because every soul has to express itself. And how does a soul express itself? You express yourself in what you do. How you respond to a situation. You're walking along the street and someone suddenly falls over and collapses and you have an appointment and you keep walking and somebody else stops and helps them get up. How come they stopped and you didn't stop? That's what you do. That's what you're how you're tuned in. And what you do expresses who you are. They say you are what you eat, you're, you are what you do. That's what you are. The bottom line of what you are is what you do. Do you do good things? Do you do acts of kindness? Do you smile or do you frown? What do you do with your life? What do you do? Another way that you, your soul expresses itself is through what you say. Do you say nice things? Or do you get angry? You have a short fuse, do you have a temper? It says in Mayam Lawes, when a person dates, considers getting married, says actually for the women, it says a woman <laughs> should test her husband in the future and see if she can get him angry. Then she'll find out if he has a temper. <laughs> said, Better to find out before than after. There's a, a very interesting interview. There was a Hassan Kala. The Hassan's name was Weiss. He became a rabbi, Rabbi Weiss. I know his children. And before he got married, he and his future wife came to the Rebbe to ask a blessing. And the Rebbe blessed them. And then she said, I would like, forgive me, I would like to speak to the Rebbe alone. He says, okay. He asked the, the, the chassan to leave the room. He says, what's the problem? She says, I don't want to get married. He said, why not? He's a nice boy. She said, because when you go out on a date, you don't find out everything about a person. And he doesn't know that I have a terrible temper. And I don't want him to find out after we get married. And then he won't want to be married to me. And I don't want to be divorced. So better than getting divorced, I don't want to get married in the first place. The Rebbe said, you shouldn't worry. In Mitz Hashem, you'll get married and you'll have children and you'll learn patience from your children. <laughs> How wise the Rebbe is. So wise. So wise. You'll learn patience from your children. In the meantime, the Rebbe said, I would advise you to, to, to get yourself a position as a volunteer in a hospital and if possible, to work in the nursery with the young, very young children and the, and the young, and the young, and beyond the nursery, the early, early stages. And this will help you to develop patience. The story goes on that they got married. It's an amazing story. Okay, Batya, good thing you're here. Uh, they didn't have any children for a, over a year. And they got concerned. The Rebbe said they were going to, she was going to have children. So they went to the, a couple of doctors and they got the bad news. She's never going to be able to have children. 
So they wrote the Rebbe a letter, you know, you gave my wife a blessing, she's gonna have children. And the doctors say she can't possibly have children. They said that she has the uterus of, an, of a young child. She cannot bear a child. Shortly after that, she began having severe pains in her legs, around her ankles and so on. And they didn't know what it was. The pains didn't go away. And they went for tests. And lo and behold, they found out she was pregnant. <laughs> Did the Rebbe answer her? He wrote a letter to the Rebbe. The Rebbe didn't answer. He didn't have to answer because he already gave her a blessing. There's no need to give her a second blessing. You don't have to ask twice. That's another general rule, girls. Get this into your heads. When you ask a blessing for the Rebbe and you don't get the answer that you want, or you don't get any answer at all, don't ask again. No answer is also an answer. No answer means you already got the blessing or there is no blessing. Either way, wait it out and you'll see. Rebbe isn't going to give you two blessings for the same thing. And if he does, it's not a good thing. The second blessing like cancels out the first. Can I ask? Yes. Did you leave the Rebbe? What did you do mean it will come right away? What? Is it whatever the Rebbe was you? You should ask again just because may not happen yet. It will eventually happen. Away. I don't know, but you don't ask twice. That's a general okay. rule. General rule, we know from stories that happened by other rebellion and so on, and even the Rebetzin, where when somebody asked a blessing from, from the Rebbe through the Rebetzin and nothing happened, and they came and they asked the Rebetzin to ask again, and the Rebetzin said, you don't ask twice. Okay. So that's it. You understand it however you want to understand it. Um, Okay, but just remember, I'm telling you now, you should remember, it's going to come up a situation, you don't ask twice. Rivka Ram. Yes. Here. Okay. Shoshana also snuck in. Good. So that's the main idea. And we also learned along the way that there's not just one level of the soul, there's not just the neshama, there's also a nefesh and a ruach, that the nefesh is connected most of all, that's where the, the soul connects with your body, but it's still a soul, it's not a body, it's a soul, it's a life force. And then higher than that is the ruach, which is connected with the feelings that you have, that the soul has a source of feelings and so on. And then there's the neshama, which is connected with godliness, and these correspond to three worlds. And we learned about four worlds which correspond to the four letters of the name of God. You listen, think this is the review. You gotta get this clear in your heads before we move on. The four worlds, okay? The world of godliness, the world in which crea creation begins to take place, that there's godliness and the world, a creation, created world, rank of high, high, lofty angels and so on. High, and then there's a world lower down where not just there's a creation beginning there, but there's actually things, not physical things, but the ideas behind things, a world of forms. Before there was a car, there was a whole idea of what a car could be. Nobody knew about it for thousands of years until uh, Henry Ford, Yamach Shemai, invented the car of Ford. I said Yemach Shemoy on him because when Israel established itself as a country, he refused to sell Fords to the, to the Jews. An anti Semite. Uh, so there's a world of forms, and then the, then the forms from the world of forms become real, physical reality in the world that we live in, the world of action. and the world of action, there's also a spiritual side to it, which is a spiritual side of the world of action that's much lower than the world of forms. We learned about all that. And then we learned that this is called the great chain of being, the Seder Hishtal Shalos. We learned a lot of things. 
the link, the chain link of worlds from the highest world, which is a world of united with God, to a world of creation, the world of forms, world of action, four general worlds corresponding to the four levels of the name of God, four letters of the name of God. And each one includes self-included so that the, you have 10 aspects. We're going to learn about them. Next chapter is in all of these worlds and they're included within the included so that you have a world within a world within a world, infinite numbers of levels. So we get to this world where things are not infinite, where things are finite, things are limited. And we see the concept of infinity in the infiniteness of creation, like King David writes, how manifold, how great and overwhelming is your creation, Hashem, who can count the grains of sand by the sea, the drops of water in the ocean, the leaves on the trees, the grass on, in the fields, who can count Every single thing given life by you, Hashem. How, what a wonder it is. Okay. And then we learn that <clears throat> the sages therefore say, if you want to connect, we have a commandment in the Torah to cleave to the righteous person because he is so connected with Torah and Torah is one thing with Hashem that he's connected with the Torah, which is Hashem. So if we want to connect to Hashem, you can't see Hashem to go connect to him. So connect to the sage, connect to the wise man, connect to the tzaddik, and it will be considered like you connected to Hashem. Got it? This is all the things that we learned in this chapter. And then finally we learn This extraordinary fact that the essence of the soul, that's what we've been talking about so far. That's the second level of the soul. But now we come to another topic, which is the garments of the soul, which we just said was thought, action, and speech. Thought, speech, and action. And they come from mom and dad. So therefore, mom and dad are told, are urged, encouraged, to sanctify themselves, to prepare themselves to have children, to do everything in a holy way that they should have holy children. Mm -hmm. That they should have holy thoughts in their mind when they have children so that the children will be sensitive to holy ideas. They should have holy feelings and do a lot of acts of kindness before having children, before they get married and before having children. And as the family is developing, because this will bring a feeling, a sensitivity for kindness, what they call a geschmack, a, a, a great pleasure. Where some people really enjoy helping other people and others, they don't enjoy helping other people. Having to help someone else is always an imposition and a resent something to it, they resent it. So we pray to God that we should have pleasure in helping other people. That pleasure comes, that feeling of pleasure comes from mom and dad. Before you were even a twinkle in their eye. Before it even happened. Before they got married. So we're always doing acts of kindness for the, for the sake of the future. We want our children to have a good future. And especially in having children, it says, that a person should sanctify himself, to do holy things, think holy things, prepare in holy ways for this momentous occasion of bringing life into the world, not take it for granted, and not just do it the same way any human creature in, in a, just a, a basic, basic animalistic kind of way. Whereas if, a, if people are unlearned and they don't even know about this whole idea, how can they do it? So how can it be that children of the illiterate, the children from a family of illiterates 
of base, simple people, what's going to be with them? Well, if these base, simple people have qualities that are not limited, like intellect is limited. Intellect is a, a blessing, but it's also a veil. It hides. Intellect hides. So it says that you have to be very careful about the children of the illiterate because great Torah can come from them. How come? Because maybe they have great emuna, faith in God. They're simple people, but maybe they really trust in Hashem. And, they have, and they're committed to doing godly things. So in so far, in so far, whatever they know, they'll do. And so that's not for now, Batya, it's a, new, a different story altogether. A great tzaddikim who came from very, very simple parents. And he concludes the chapter with this, that sometimes it can happen that the neshama, the neshama is, remember, a part of God, which its loftiness is we can't begin to know how great the neshama is. The neshama of a tremendously great, huge, tremendous tzaddik can be born into a very, very simple person in a simple family. And part of the challenge of his life will be to transform his physical simplicity into the life of a great tzaddik will be a leader of a generation. Thank you very much. We're going to move on tomorrow to chapter three. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.